It is the first of January, 2024. We're starting a new year and this is my year in review. 2023 was a big year for me, not in terms of business growth or finances, but actually in terms of lessons learned. I've learned so much both personally and business-wise. And there are a lot of things that I did right and a lot of things that I did wrong, a lot of wins, but also, also a lot of losses. And so I figured, you know what, I'd come on here and just share those with you. And the reason why I want to share them with you is because I've actually found it very beneficial to learn from others. And there are a few people who I have followed and watched that have saved me years of heartache and years of pain by making mistakes that I know I would have eventually made if it wasn't without their guidance. And so if I can come on here and share the experiences that I've had, the lessons that I've learned, then hopefully there is someone out there um, that will avoid um, avoid doing what I did and we'll be able to get to where they want to get to faster as a result. So I was sitting in bed and I was actually reflecting on, on my 2023 and I don't really love doing new year's resolutions. Instead, what I, I prefer to do is reflect and go, okay, what was, what were the mistakes that I made? What lessons did I, did I learn? And then be very clear with what they are to make sure that when I move forward into in the new year, I keep them at the forefront of my mind to avoid making um, those mistakes. I remember at the start of 2023, one of the lessons that I had learned, a mistake that I'd made the year prior, was I prolonged tough decision making. So if there was, you know, a staff member I had to let go, if I had to make a pivot in my business. If there was a, you know, whatever it may be, if there's a really tough decision that was emotional, I used to really prolong it and avoid it and, you know, and, and try to avoid making it. Um, I told myself going into 2023, I'd do them quickly. And I stuck by that. And then as a result, I feel like I've made five years worth of progress in, in a year. Um, and so I find these very, very beneficial. And I, uh, I look forward to reflecting on it in the future. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, uh, screen share over here. I've actually gotten uh, this little cool tool where I can write down and we can have a bit of like a whiteboard experience. Um, this video wasn't really prepared. So um, sit back, relax. And uh, yeah, let's, let's spend some uh, time together going through uh, the lessons of 2023. Okay. So the first thing I actually want to start with, uh, and this is a big lesson that I learned, and that is you can have all the right skills, you can have discipline, you can put in the hours, you can go at 100 kilometers an hour, but it won't matter, all of this over here, this won't matter if you are rowing in the wrong boat. Okay, this is you over here. This is your row. If you're rowing in the wrong wrong boat, none of this is going to matter. This was a huge, huge lesson that I had to learn. And and I always looked and I went, okay, I don't understand. Like why why is it that you know I've 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 been working so hard for for so long, but yet I haven't progressed um anywhere near where I want to get to. Now, for some context, where I want to get to, my goal, my goal for the first part of my life as an entrepreneur is to reach $10 million a year in turnover in the business that I run, but more importantly, to run a business that does 30 to 40% in profit. So a business that is very, very profitable. Now, I know a lot of businesses at this level aren't as profitable, don't make as much profit as this, but I... Um, I know that it is possible in my field and in the space that I pl plan on play playing in. Um, and that is going to be part of my challenge, right? That's why I didn't set a goal for 100 million at, you know, 10% profit. I actually just want to build a business that maybe may not turn, you know, 30, 40 million, 10 million a year, but has very, very high profit margins. And I can go into why that, it, that, that specifically in later videos. So this is where I have, been working relentlessly towards. And this year and the years prior, I felt as though I wasn't making too much progress towards it. And I understand these things take time. And I also understand that in the world of entrepreneurship, you can have moments of exponential growth, which I have went through. So you you may you may be at one to two million a year and then boom, just explode in one year to seven and then the next to 10. Um, so things can happen very, very quickly. 
But the question I was asking is, why is it that there are other people who are less skilled than me, who are less disciplined, who put in less hours, who don't work as hard, but I feel as though they are progressing and growing their business faster than I am. And although I'm happy for, 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 for them, and it's not, it doesn't come from a place of envy, it comes from a place of curiosity. Why is that? I learned that it's because they're in better boats. And here's the thing I want you to remember, and this is a lesson that I learned. It doesn't matter how skilled you are here, how hard you're rowing. You could even have two other people rowing with you. But if there is someone over here who is in a freaking speedboat, let's just say this was a, a speedboat, this is the speedboat going, they're over here chilling. They could be less talented, work less, they could be less skilled, less deserving, and they are going to fly right past you, okay? And the negative current, the water current that goes against them, they won't even feel it. But if you're in a kayak over here, right? and there is a negative current going against you, not only are you gonna feel it, but it's gonna be so painful, you're always gonna be feeling like you're going against the grain. And essentially the lesson that was learned is it's not how hard you row, but the size of the boat you're in. That's it. And so what this did, this lesson here is a, allowed me to take a look at my business model. Model. Compare it with other business models. And then I began to ask myself, how can I put myself in a better boat? How can I put myself in a speed boat? Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is by um, shifting niches, taking a look at different niche, offer different types of services. So instead of just offering, say, labor services, where it's just about, you know, you doing marketing for someone or you exchanging a service, you start to take a look at potentially offering um, media as a service. So this could be like a course of sorts. You know, you put in effort, you put it together, you train someone, you train a team. Um, it could be code, putting together some sort of SaaS product. Now, I haven't acted on these things here, but it's just things that I've started to slowly look at because you know you find that a lot of these businesses that have scalable potential operate here. And it actually goes back to um, uh, this uh, you know pyramid of leverage, which was uh, in the, a book that I read by a guy called Naval something. But if you just look up Le N N N Naval, billionaire, you'll find the name. Um, and it just, it, it talks about how different businesses leverage different things. So this lowest leverage, low, the, 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 the worst thing that you can leverage is labor, which is most service-based businesses. It's the hardest to grow, slowest, slowest to grow. The second best thing to leverage is capital. Capital is, you know, people who invest into property, you put your money to work, your money makes you money. You don't even have to put in any effort. It's a better leverage tool. Um, because, like let's say for example with labor, if you want to go from ten to ten million, that's going to require hiring like fifty to one hundred people. Um, I'm, I just kind of threw that number out randomly. But if you wanted to go from a million to ten million with capital, you could go and get more capital from people, put that capital to use, and probably make you know say that ten million dollars a bit easier. It's obviously riskier, but it doesn't require as much hiring and and training, and doesn't require as much labor. And then you have code and then you have uh, media. And I think code and media was actually uh, together. So an example of code is essentially something that you spend a lot of effort in building once that then can get sold um, and and uh, over and over again. Um, and media, uh, media from what I understand is similar to like Kylie Jenner, where she has a lot of people who follow her and she can drop a product and then become a billionaire. I also see media um, as, for example, a big reason why 
course content businesses and coaching programs are such prof profitable and good business models. Um, and it's largely because they put in a lot of effort recording content, teaching people how to do something they're really good at. And then once the content's recorded, they can sell that over and over again. And it doesn't require one-on-one -on -one coaching or any extra effort from them. And so it's very, very scalable. And so the, the, essentially the, the higher you go up this leverage ladder here or leverage pyramid, um, the more money you can actually make the bigger you can scale um, and the faster that you will scale as well. Okay. So essentially when I take a look at my biggest, one of my biggest lessons last year, one thing that I really reflected on and would continue to reflect on into the new year is really paying attention to the boat that I'm in and not just focusing on rowing harder. That's always been how I've reacted. I need to work harder, work smarter, be more disciplined. I've got to build my skills. And although all these things help, um, they don't, really make the biggest difference in the world if you're in the wrong boat. And so I've been working a lot behind the scenes to make sure I get my very own speedboat. So that was one of the first lessons. The second lesson um, that I learned, and when I learned it this year, it was actually by a guy called Sam Ovens watching his content. Um, doesn't make as much content anymore, but I'd highly recommend you go and watch his old videos on, on YouTube. Okay. He had this video and the video was talking about flywheels and what he was saying made so much sense. And it explains such pain that I was experiencing. And he was essentially explaining that businesses that grow linearly, right? Versus businesses that grow exponentially. The thing that is common in these businesses that grow exponentially is they have a flywheel. Okay. And businesses that don't grow exponentially or don't grow as quick, they have an anti, um, anti flywheel. Okay. So the anti flywheel is probably best explained by me drawing something out. So let me just quickly draw this out for you. So let's say, for example, you've got a an agency, right? The problem with my agency is, uh, first of all, I went from e-com specific, and then I pivoted to a different niche. I niche down, and the niche that I in, in, niche down to was construction, specifically helping bathroom renovators. Now this was a better, a better boat, right? I wasn't going against the, against the grain because e-com is very saturated. The e-com niche is, is hard. It's hard to get results. You have to run this person's entire business. So I niched down and I started helping a different avatar and it was easier to get clients. It was easier to get leads. It was easier to get booked appointments. Um, and we, we signed on, you know, more clients in, in 45 days, in a 45 day period, we signed on more clients in this new niche than we had the entire year previously in e-com. So I found myself an easier, a better boat. And I was like, oh my gosh, this whole time I've been trying to work harder, trying to figure this out when I just had to make a, an, a, a you know, strategic pivot and I was able to get results. But this wasn't perfect either, right? Um, and, and I'll go into details of this, but essentially this here, it was easier to grow and scale, but this business model had what we call an anti- flywheel, which means it was good at the beginning, but then as we begin to grow and scale, particularly when your goal is to get to 10 M's plus, you need a business that can scale and scale quickly. If you've got an anti flywheel, you're going to get to a certain limit, but you're not going to be able to scale beyond that. Now the anti flywheel works this way, right? You've got this over here. This is the wheel growth. This is what you want. And then over here, um, sorry, I don't know why I keep saying that. So that over here you have like, let's just go attention on clients. Just bear with me as I draw this out. Then you have client results. And then over here you have new clients. And then over here you have time. Boom. And the essential idea of a flywheel is very simple. The, for every one customer added, the experience gets better. If this holds true, then you have a flywheel. 
if it doesn't hold true, then you have an anti flywheel. Okay. So I'll, I'll explain why this here did not hold true for our pivot into, um, you know, helping like bathroom renovation clients. So what was happening is we were offering, um, you know, renovation, renovation business owners, um, qualified quotes, right? We'd come, we'd go into their business, we'd build them the landing page, run their ads, get them a whole bunch of leads, turn those leads into qualified appointments. Everything was going great. We got, you know, first client, perfect. Second client, perfect. But then by the third, fourth, fifth, sixth client, it progressively got worse. Okay. So here's what happens. You have over here, you have attention on clients, right? Now with the first, at the beginning, you have a lot of time. And so then you take on more clients and because what you're offering is purely labor, it requires labor, it requires human resources. The, the, you have more time, you have all the time. So you give clients a lot of attention. And so clients get a lot of result, results and then you get new clients. But with every new client that you get in this business model, you actually start to have less time, right? Because if you want to grow and scale this profitably, you may have an account manager that is handling five people and you need them to eventually be able to handle 15, right? And so naturally you've got a, this constantly diminishing, not just for yourself, but for your team. So less time. So you get new clients. Now you have less time. And so that the attention on clients goes down. And so then the client results go down and then you get less new clients, especially if people are having a bad experience, right? And this was the problem with this flywheel. Now, in addition to this, the reason, another big reason why this experience got worse is because if you're taking on clients, we, we, we were actually taking on clients from a, like a local area. So let's say we're in, um, you know, we're in Sydney, right? The first, and this is Sydney over here. Let's just say that that's Sydney. The first client we, we we got in and we advertised, right? And was targeting this 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 radius. He was happy. He was doing well. He was getting leads. And then we took on another client because we want to grow as a business. And then this client was crossing over with this client, right? And then we took on our third client and then they were crossing over with this client. And then we took over our fourth client. And then by the time we had five clients, all of these clients were number one, seeing each other's ads right? Number two, there, because our, our, the way that we were marketing them was relatively similar to get the result. Um, they were having an, a negative experience with their customers because, be, because their customers would see their ad inquire and the Facebook algorithm would then show them ads from other people that you were working with and be like, Oh, you're not the only person who's doing this. Oh, okay. I, I'm actually going to inquire with this other company as well. We're also our clients. And so, it made it harder for them to close deals. And then eventually, which is inevitable, is that there was lead crossover. Now, if I am charging 5,000 a month, right? And I've got the suburb of Sydney and I can sign on, you know, five people, that's 25K per month, right? Then we have Melbourne, then we have Brisbane, then we have the Gold Coast. You can very quickly see that if with five clients, you could get to probably 100 to 150K per month, then you might have to like across and go into a different niche and different industry. And you can absolutely do that. But the problem is even at five clients in a city, right? You have this not being ticked. And I don't want to run a business like this. I don't want to run a business that is constantly churning and burning. Um, you don't want to run a business where with every new client you bring on, there will eventually be a negative experience because those businesses do not experience exponential growth like this. They experience very slow um, and uh, linear growth, right? And so this model itself worked to a certain point, but it wasn't going to work to be able to scale to that 10 M plus. And I quickly, you know, realized it. So when you're running your business, I want you to ask yourself a question. And that is for every one client added, would the experience get better? Another thing to ask yourself is, are you in a negative 
word of mouth business, business, right? So for me, every client that I got, I am not being assisted by word of mouth because when I take on Jimmy and he's a bathroom renovator up in Melbourne or in, 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 in Sydney, he he's not only incentivized not to give me a word of mouth referral since we only work with bathroom renovators because he knows uh, he's going to refer his friend. He's now going to become a direct competitor with him, but he's incentivized to give me negative word of mouth, which is go out of his way to not recommend us, especially if he's getting good results. And that's actually what happened. We had a client in Brisbane, right? And he was killing it. We did 700K in rev in four months for him absolutely smashed results for him. And then we took on one other client and this client got upset and said, I don't like the fact that you're working with my competitor, take me off. And then I, he, he also had, um, we, we were using him as a case study, right? And he said, remove me. I don't want to be used as a case study because I don't want other people knowing that, that I'm using you guys because then they're going to come and copy me and they're going to grow and I want to be the best, right? So there was negative word of mouth. We we're offering a service where people were actually incentivized to not tell people, to try and hide that they were working with us um, because of the competition. Absolute mess. And this is why uh, looking in hindsight, it was so hard to really grow a business in this structure um, because you've got, you know, a bit of a, an anti-flywheel taking place. And so what we ended up doing was we pivoted to a qualified quote, um, you know, qualified appointment basis where we weren't advertising anyone anymore. We got a lead through advertising our own brand, and then we were distributing it to people based on how many appointments they wanted to get. That was a, that's a much better business model because no one's seeing each other's ads. Um, they're incentivized somewhat to still recommend and refer because they look, I'm getting my five or 10 appointments a month. Hey, if you want to get some work, these guys can probably give you another five. I don't feel like you're competing directly against me. It was a better flywheel. We're still having some issues with learning, knowing how we're going to scale that, but it's all relatively new and we're going to discover how we're going to do that in the new year. Um, but that is essentially what we're looking for. When you're noticing that it's hard and, and you're going against the grain, pay attention to this stuff. Do you have an anti-flywheel and are you in a negative word of mouth um, business? And how can you change things to a model where you can start getting word of mouth on your side? Right. When you build a website for someone, they'll, they'll, they will recommend you to their friends, right? Because you building a website for their friend doesn't hurt them, right? It actually may benefit them because they're going to refer you and that you're going to give, give them a good website. But if you offer purely marketing services for say, um, you know, kitchen renovators in a specific city, they are not incentivized to refer you. And so you're never going to have word of mouth on your side. And word of mouth is really the ultimate goal for any business. You want to build, try to get your business to a point where it just operates off word of mouth. Um, so you can lower spend, get still get customers, and then you just become extremely profitable down the line. So if you're in a business that has negative word of mouth, you need to change your model and change your structure. I have no idea how much time, how many minutes we're in, but let's keep going. So the other thing, and this is, this is a quick lesson I can give you is I, one thing that I learned this year, it wasn't a mistake, it's actually something I did well. And that was every, every dollar I put into paying my ignorance tax was worth its weight in gold. Let's say this is a gold bar. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. <laughs> Let's say that's a, this is a gold bar over here, right? It was worth its weight in gold. And I wish I did it sooner. And I plan on doing it even more going into the new year. You're over here. The place that you want to get to is over here, right? This is where you want to get to. But the journey is literally like this to get there. And that's if you do it on your own. But if you can find someone along the journey, right, who has been here, and you can convince them to come and join you, they'll make the journey like this for you. This saves you time and pain because this is you going down the, the route. Every dollar I have spent in investing into books, 
courses, paying for people one-on-one -on -one has been so worth it. I wouldn't have learned all of this stuff I just shared with you if I didn't do this well. And that's what I plan on doing in a big way. And at the moment, at this time that this video is being recorded, I'm imagining watching like five years down the track, I know eventually I won't be in a position to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring or coaching or anything like that. But currently I, I do. I have a program called the Bootcamp where I work with um, entrepreneurs doing between two to 20K and I help them grow and scale beyond that. And when I sit down sometimes and I have one-on-ones and I'm sitting with someone and I, and they've been telling me they've been struggling with this particular issue and been stagnant for six months and I know exactly how to solve their problem and then I solve it for them, I always think to myself, if I, I had to go through like two years of pain to have figured this out and, and I've just told you in literally 30 minutes and I've experienced doing that for people and I've had it, I've had the experience of having it done for me. And so going into the new year, boy, am I putting in, putting aside some money to make sure I constantly invest um, into bridging my knowledge gap, uh, particularly with paying for really, really, really highly um, specific knowledge. Um, like there was a guy recently who I, I watched an interview and he was able to scale in like 12 months to 300K in a very single uh, similar business model. And I just reached out to him on Instagram and I said, hey, mate, um, watch your interview. I'm happy to pay you for your time. He said, you know, I'm busy. And then I'm like, come on, man, let's make it happen. And he gave me whatever I had to pay him. I think it was like a thousand dollars. And I'm like, hundred percent, let's do it. Right. And I look forward to that call that I've got scheduled with him soon, but that's what I'm going to do more of because this person's not well known. They're not famous, but it was like a, a an interview with like a thousand views, but because I know this individual here has run a business very similar to mine and is um and has figured something out. I will do. I will pay them what they want to figure out what it is that I know I'm eventually going to have to learn. And so, putting aside time to pay down your ignorance tax is massive. Okay, that's another big lesson for mine. Another big lesson that I'm going to go into the new year with is I always thought it was about marketing and sales. Obsessed with, can I get more? Can I do my marketing better? Can I get more sales? We were able to really knuckle down on our marketing and our sales. And we had no problem getting people to pay us. It was light work. Lots of people wanted to pay us for our service, but the product wasn't product was no good in the sense that it worked with a couple clients, but did not work um, at scale, uh, which explained what I just mentioned before. And so the product is everything. When you have a good product, everything becomes easy. And so even though you're probably going to hear everyone talking to you about how to market better, how to close more deals, Unless you're selling someone else's product or marketing someone else's product, this is where the majority of your focus needs to be. Don't get lost in thinking that it's all about marketing and sales and that you can actually scale and scale effectively without having an incredible product. When you have an incredible product, that's when you're now in a good boat. That's another thing. It's like being in the right boat, but having an amazing engine, right? When you have the right product, everything becomes easy. You don't have to work as hard. You'll get people referring to you. You'll get people buying from you. You'll get people coming to buy more from you more often. And so the focus should always be on the product. I got obsessed with this and this, um, and, I, and I neglected this a little bit, even though I really couldn't have learned this lesson unless I went through it. Like I couldn't have really known that it wasn't going to be as effective at scale unless I scaled. Um, and so I don't like, I'm not going to kick myself for it but it's definitely a lesson learned. And so my focus now, um, for the most part, I know I've got marketing down packs and sales is no problem. Um, products is my number one priority. 
as I move forward into the new year, I'm going to be completely laser focused on building the best possible product um, uh, for, for, for our customers and making sure that for every new customer that is added, the overall experience gets better. And then I have a positive fly, a flywheel. And I know just by making those adjustments, this year is going to be a, a much bigger and better year. Next would be, um, uh, I've already mentioned the word of mouth. Uh, no two markets are the same. You know, this is just a, a small thing that I'll, I think I definitely will remember in the future is we tried expanding to the USA, spent around 20K in two months, both on ads and, you know, staff and wages and, you know, everything else, trying to expand to the US with our offer. So obviously we were helping renovators um, in Australia and we figured, you know what, why don't we take this and, since we can't keep expanding and growing here, we can only take on a certain amount of people per city. Why don't we go to America? Because America is like 50, 50 states and you know, like 100 plus cities. Um, there'd be a, a bigger market over there. And I, I still think that that would be true. And, and there was, all, of that, all of that was true. I definitely had a bigger you know, market cap over there. But the USA was a completely different market um, to Australia. How we advertise our Australian renovators when we tried doing it for the US didn't work as well. And people in the US are there, it's a it's a future market. And so if you have a unique offer to Aussies, when you go to the US, they're like, I've heard your offer before. Because typically what happens in the US eventually comes to Australia. So if if I had an offer um like or a crazy guarantee, you know, like I'll book, you know you know, uh, a certain amount of quotes, but you have to pay a retainer. When I went to the US, that was already saturated in that market. When I spoke to people here who are, you know, what they call remodelers in America, they're like, mate, you know, and I didn't say mate, they would say, you know, we've heard this before. There's nothing new or unique about this. Um, uh, what, what makes you different to everyone else? And have do you have experience in the American market? And so that's why we spent so much, but failed to actually really gain any momentum. And so the lesson that I'll learn moving forward is dominate your own backyard first, right? I shouldn't have went and taken something that was broken. I shouldn't have tried to take a broken flywheel and that negative customer experience and try to go to another market. Instead, I should have tried to fix my flywheel in the Australian market because you can definitely build a 10 mil business just from the Australian market. And so my problem was more so with my service and my product and how I delivered it rather than the actual market that I was in. Although it's true that the American market's bigger, um, I was taking a broken product to them and because I know there'd be more people to buy there um, rather than try and actually develop a better product, essentially. What's next? Uh, let me take a look over here. Take a look at my notes. There's a few, few, few more here. Hopefully you guys are enjoying this and you know finding it valuable. I know I'm enjoying recording it. Next on the list is just coming to reality that I'm not, I'm not as advanced as an entrepreneur as I thought I was. I had to become humble. My biggest mistake before was thinking I knew everything. What I, where, I, where I went wrong is I had all the skills, right? The right foundations to become very successful. So I'm very good at sales, very good at marketing, very good at leadership. I know how to recruit people. I'm, I'm willing to put in the hours. I have the right skills. I have the right foundations, but knowledge I did not have and still acknowledge I don't have. I don't have the knowledge to scale to 10 million a year, Right. I thought I did. I thought I knew everything. And so because I thought I knew everything, I wasn't putting my time and energy in the right place. I was just operating confused and frustrated. But now I know that I don't know everything. I have this here. This is good. I have the right foundations, uh, but, but this is what I lack. 
And the only way I'm going to get here is by bridging the gap, which is the education gap between that, that I have to be able to get here. I need to speak to the right people. So that was another big, big, big thing that I learned is I'm not as advanced as I thought I was. And I need to humble myself and keep on learning. Otherwise, I'm not going to get to where I want to get to. Another big lesson is make it easier. Very simple. This was the first year I actually got on top of my health, which includes food plus gym. And the way I did that was by making things easier. Very simple um, strategy is less friction on the stuff that you want to do. So let's say on the stuff you want to do, more friction on the stuff you don't want to do. What does this mean? Okay, so let's say, for example, you want to eat healthy, right? Friction would be every time you're hungry, you need to cook food. Instead, instead of cooking, prep, prep meals. So when you're hungry and you open the fridge, you're not then going, oh my God, I'm so hungry. I can't really be stuffed now cooking food. I'd rather just order Uber Eats, right? Or going to work or going to an office without prepped meals and then being you know, tempted to just order Uber Eats or eat, eating something unhealthy, okay? So prepping your meals reduces the friction that you need. Now, going through the effort of actually prepping your meals yourself, that's friction. So you can take it another level. How do you make it less friction? The way I made it less, less friction is I just purchased prep meals. I found a, a company where I could purchase prep meals and then I made it less, less friction. And that's, and that's the way that you do it. Really. You just get prep meals from, and that's the way you do it. You always think about what can I do to create less friction going to the gym. So I, my, I lived over here, right? My gym was over here and my partner lived over here. So when I was skipping gym and not really going as often, I'd have to drive there and then drive all the way back here. Just that little 15 minute trip that I'd have to make backwards would cause enough friction that I would just skip the gym. Instead, what I did is I live here. My partner lives here. I signed up to a gym here. So then I would go to the gym and then go and see her. It was on my way. In fact, we started doing it together. I'd go here, pick her up, and then we go to the gym and then we go back. Less friction. This increased the amount of uh, times I would go to the gym and then prepping my meals increased the amount that I was able uh, to actually eat healthy, right? Very simple, less friction on the things that you want to do, more friction on the things you don't want to do. So more friction on the things you don't want to do is, for example, let's say you like playing video games, right? You shouldn't have your console just connected. Your console should be unconnected, um, in a closet. So you actually have to go through the effort of taking it out of the closet, putting it all together to play your game, right? You create more friction around the things that you want to do less of. Uh, if you want to go less on social media, create more friction by deleting the apps and having to reinstall them every time you want to use them. I know it seems like effort, but that's the whole point. If you just have all the apps on your phone and you can access them whenever you want, then the friction is really, there is no friction there. And so you end up just binging on the social media apps. I delete the apps and reinstall them when I need. When I you know, plan on creating content or uploading anything, or there's something specific I want to check, then I just, uh, I, I, I reinstall the apps. I log in again, and then I view them. It takes a bit of time, um, but it, it's not going to take that extra five minutes is going to be nothing compared to the, you know, 10 hours a week you will waste going on these apps if you don't have um, that friction. Um, if you are bad with, you know, snacking, put, put the snacks somewhere that is really far out of reach like, you know, another side of the room or just don't have it at all completely. That's just the idea. When you create less friction on the things you want to do, you do them more often. And when you create friction on the things you don't want to do, you do them less often. And this here was the reason why I was able to get into the best shape of my life. Um, and yeah, things have just become so easy. Going to the gym's easy, eating healthy is easy. Um. Now, the last thing that I will mention, and this is a big lesson, is the grass is not greener on the other side. 
it's greener where you water it. There have been so many times where I've been so frustrated that I've just th thought to myself, you know what? It's my niche. It's my industry. I'm just going to pivot. I'm going to start a different business model, a different agency, a different this, a different that. But the reality is, is that it's not always your niche, right? It's not just, it's not your niche. Sometimes you can stay within the same niche, right? Use the same skills, but just deliver it in a different way. Okay. And that's a big lesson that I'm, I'm learning and I plan on committing to in the new year. You know, I plan on continuing to help um, in the construction and tradie space. Although there are a lot of things about this niche <laughs> that frustrates me. I feel like I can really help these guys and I want to build a service and a product and solution around making that happen. And I acknowledge that maybe the way that I've delivered until this point is not going to get me until this range selfishly. And so I'm going to continue to make adjustments to see what it is that I can deliver for them to get there. A year from now, I may choose to have completely pivoted out of this to get into a different boat altogether, but that's fine but I know that I'm not just bouncing around from shiny object syndrome to shiny object syndrome. The grass is not greener on the other side. You know, you might see people doing drop shipping, remote closing. You might see people doing Amazon, FBA, et cetera, et cetera. AI, automation and you might be seeing people killing it and doing well and thinking you know what it's an issue with the niche the industry the service that i'm in when the reality is the reason why they're doing well is because they're really just watering where they're at and you have to be careful not to compare your chapter one with people's chapter 50 okay if i end up figuring out this industry and how I'm going to help these individuals and my business gets to this point, I guarantee you many people will go, it's because Leo was in the right niche. Leo was in the right industry. Leo's offering the right product. But I didn't think that. I didn't think that until it became true. There would have been years and years of me thinking it was the niche, the industry, the business model. I should just do Amazon FBA, right? But the reason why I eventually figured it out is because I chose the grass of which I was watering, right? So that's my 2023 um, lessons. Hopefully you found it valuable. I hope you can walk away with a few things from this and apply it into your own life. I'm excited for 2024. I think it has potential to be um, a big year. I don't think 2024 is the year that I experience the massive, massive business scale and life-changing growth. I think this is the year that I figure out what boat I'm going to row in. And then once I decide that, it's going to be head down and building, just building, building that ultimate product to service, making sure I've got that positive flywheel effect, making sure I'm building a product um, and service that really is going to help people in a massive way um, that gets better with every customer that is added, you know, to it. Um, but while I'm on that, uh, the idea of network effects, um, Sam Ovens talks about how the first person who would have gone a mobile phone, it's useless, but with every phone that was added, it became more and more valuable, right? Because there was more people to speak to. You think about Facebook Facebook had a positive flywheel because every time someone signed up, the experience became better for everyone else. And that's why Facebook is a 50, is a, what I don't know, what multi hundred billion dollar company. Every customer that was added, the experience got better for everyone else, right? So we think about that with Facebook. We think about the, the mobile phones. No one's ever said, oh, don't come and join Facebook because it's going to make the experience worse for me. 
Now, if you're running a normal type of business and you don't plan on scaling fast and scaling quickly and scaling to like crazy heights, you don't need to worry and obsess too much about creating these flywheels. These flywheels are particularly important for those that are looking to experience accelerated growth um, and really reach pretty massive heights, which I want to do. One thing I've realized about myself is as time goes on, I notice I care less and less about the money, although the money is important, but I do care less and less about it and more and more about just becoming the best business owner and the best entrepreneur I can possibly be. I love building businesses and I love building services, service-based businesses specifically. I like helping others. And so I'm just going to continue to lean into that. I love doing this and I want to do this at the best, highest, you know, the highest rate, right? You look at a goal like $10 million a year in revenue, three to 4 million profit. You may be thinking Leo wants to make millions in profit because he wants to do A, B, C, and D, but that's actually not the right, not the case. Basketball players who are competing at the highest level, all they want is that NBA championship ring. That ring, that trophy that they win is a milestone. It's something they're going to treasure. As an entrepreneur, we do not get trophies when we succeed. We not, do not get awards. What we do get, however, is our version of a, of a trophy or a championship ring is building a successful business that is doing a certain amount of revenue and generating a certain amount in profit. Getting to 10 million a year, but with 5% profit is not successful. But getting to 10 million a year with 30 to 40% profit, that displays someone who's built an efficient business that is profitable, um, that is, yeah, just done well, built well. And that's what I want. I want to build a really successful and good business because I love business and I want to be the best possible business owner I can be. So hopefully that adds more context. I'm excited again for what this year has in store and I, I wish you guys all the best.